you all for coming. It's always wonderful to um, see a, a, a large group of people. Uh, you're in, going to be hearing a, a difficult but a really important talk by Dr. William Carrigan today. I just want to, my name is Ron Weisberger. I'm the director of our Holocaust and Genocide Center. And again, I just want to welcome you and thank you for coming. Um, we are collaborating with the um, Multicultural Center at Bristol Community College. And um, I just always do be thanking our advisory committee that's on here at Bristol College for our support. But I want to introduce DT, who is the, uh, he'll tell you who he is. He does a number of things. He was a multicultural center. But anyway, thank you again for coming. Good morning, everybody. Thank you all so much. Uh, I am Dr. Daryl D.T. Henry. I am the interim director of the Multicultural Student Center here. I'm also the, the director of the TRIO department here. Most people know about the Multicultural Student Center. TRIO is a family funded program that serves students who are first generation and low income. And so we work with all of the students in the Fall River School District, 6th through 12th grade, help them persist in high school, get aware about college, uh, enroll in college, graduate, all that good stuff. So I do those two things. I'm also involved with the Black Student Union, all of that good stuff. Uh, I love being in higher ed. So today is great. Uh, we love to collaborate. And being it is the kickoff of Black History Month, I think it's important to understand how historically all of our cultures have sometime, at some point gone through something that we may be able to relate to each other. And this is a great opportunity for us to understand that. So I'm glad to excited to introduce Dr. William D. Kerrigan today. He is, he has taught, he is the department, he's from the Department of History at Bowen University. I'm gonna read you a little bit of his bio so I'll get it all correct. Dr. Kerrigan has taught more than 100 course topics such as Civil War and Reconstruction in the American West and has published numerous scholarly essays and has authored or edited four books. I know that because I have actually cited some of that work in my time as a scholar. He was also named a distinguished lecturer by the Organization of American Historians in 2015. His research has been cited widely in the news media, including the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Nation, and the Houston Chronicle. So I would like to present to some and introduce to others Dr. William D. Harrington. Uh, it is a true pleasure to be here. Everyone can hear me, I presume. Sounds good. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a difficult subject, uh, and I'll go into the question of how did I get started on studying uh, lynching and why maybe do I still continue uh, to study lynching. Uh, let see if I can get this quicker to work. Uh, so, yeah, thank you to Ron and to Dr. Henry uh, for the invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to, uh, to be here. Hello. Uh, go to the computer. Oh, oh, there we go. Oh, no. All right, well, there we go, I think. I wanted to show you this. That's cool. Ron. Yeah, try, try it again. Here we go. So thanks to Ron for speaking. This is what Ron looks like in the present. Thank you very much. And, uh, of course, uh, as some of you know, Ron went to Glassboro State College, which is uh, now Rowan University, and this is what Ron looked like in 1965 when he graduated. Uh, anyway, so thanks to the Bristol Multicultural uh, Student Center, of course, and to uh, the fine folks who made and advertised uh, my talk here. Okay, so uh, the first thing I'm going to jump into is how did I get interested in studying lynching? So uh, I started off at uh, University of Texas at Austin, which I went from my undergraduate, and uh, I started off as a mechanical engineering major. I had no idea about studying history or anything like that, but for various reasons, I ended up leaving engineering. I was undecided for a while, and one of the courses that I took uh, was George Wright's U.S. History class. Uh, George Wright was a phenomenal lecturer. I'll just tell you this, I don't know, this, this doesn't happen for me, but he taught classes at 8 a.m. in the morning, he had 500 students, and every class that he taught ended with a standing ovation uh, by the students. Uh, and truly inspiring uh, professor. Uh, but his influence on me was, was profound because one of the things that he did was he brought to campus, and this was in the 1990s, early 1990s, 
photographs of lynching victims. I knew very little, almost nothing, about the history of lynching at that time. Maybe some vague ideas about cattle rustlers and African Americans, maybe. I can't even go back really easily to my mind at that time. I just knew I knew very little or nothing about it. And of course, it was, at that time, there was no internet. You couldn't find photographs of lynching victims anywhere. And uh, he passed around, photocopied, or maybe mimeographed, uh, uh, photograph images of these lynching victims, and that had a powerful impact on me. It really changed uh, my life. So we'll go back to the clicker and see if the clicker works here. Yes. And one of the images was of Leo Frank, uh, the one of the, the few Jewish victims of lynch moms. Uh, but I thought it might be appropriate to mention that, uh, given the co-sponsorship by the Holocaust and Genocide Center. But I didn't focus too much on Leo Frank at the time. <coughs> the images that I focused on and stayed with me were the lynching of Jesse Washington. He was lynched in Waco, Texas. The crowd estimated that his lynching was 15,000. Maybe it was 10,000. It was thousands for sure. And the reason why this mattered so much to me is not only the horrific photographs, but I grew up very near uh, Waco, Texas. I grew up on a farm outside of Waco in a little place called Chalk Bluff. Uh, I definitely wondered what I would have done if I had been alive in 1916. Would I have been in the mob? Uh, I would have liked to have said no, but Waco only had like 30 uh, something thousand people at the time. 15,000 people attending means a lot of people showed up at this. It was in the middle of the day and they burned them alive as you can see. And here's another image of the, of the crowd. Uh, thousands of people. Uh, present for the burning of another human being. Now, I should say that I grew up in rural Texas. I knew racism, absolutely. Knew lots of people that were racist. I knew a person who had joined the Ku Klux Klan. Mostly that meant he had purchased for a lot of money some white robes. But uh, he was, uh, so I knew racism. And that was not surprising to me. But still there was something that was I didn't think that even these racists that I knew and grew up with would have endorsed burning someone alive. To me, it was, it was still hard to understand how this happened. And, you know, of course, I knew that there were there truly evil people in the world. There still are and probably always will be. But this is not a crowd and an event that you can just say, well, there were a few truly sadistic evil people. This event had thousands attend. It had no punishment of anyone involved, even though the names of all the leaders of it were published in a newspaper not long after because of an investigative reporter. This was something else uh, beyond uh, the, the, the things of just a few individuals. And so uh, that, was, that was why these images stayed with me. It was really the crowd uh, that I couldn't get out of my head and what led me to end up studying what I'm studying now. So the question that I kind of formed right you know, very shortly after this, and this is a question that still dominates my research today, which is this one. Why did ordinary people throughout the United States, but especially in the South, come to support or at least tolerate the extra-legal execution of African Americans that at times included torture and ritualized violence such as burning? I've done a lot of work on lynching since then, but that's kind of my first question that I had, and it's still a question that motivates me uh, all the way to the present. Uh, over time, I would realize that uh, other scholars had asked similar questions. This is the work of Christopher Browning. Those of you who study the Holocaust may know his work. Uh, he asked the same question about uh, the Holocaust. He said, how could so many ordinary Germans have gone along with, tolerated, looked the other way? You can't blame the Holocaust just on Hitler and the SS and a few Germans. It, was, uh, it had uh, broader support, and he tried to understand how these people who otherwise would have lived normal lives, ended up uh, being part of it. His book is fascinating, and I recommend that you read it. So I felt a kinship uh, to Christopher Browning and to Holocaust historians uh, right from the very beginning. I won't go into all the detail of the research, but I, since I started with a senior thesis, which I wrote under the direction of George Wright, who I showed you earlier. I then decided to go to graduate school upon his recommendation. When I first started college, I didn't even know what graduate school was. Uh, but he thought that I could actually uh, do well, and so I ended up going to Emory University in Atlanta. But anyway, the research for my doctor, doctorate and my first book, and this is the uh, 20th anniversary of my 
This talk is mainly about my first book, which is, comes out of the study of Jesse Washington. It's 20, 20 years since it was published, and this is one of several events I'm doing kind of as part of the 20th anniversary, and I'm very pleased that people still uh, are interested in this work uh, all these years uh, later. And if we have time for the question and answer, I can talk a little bit about how I've changed, how the field has changed, and kind of my current work, which is still on lynching all these years later, if we have time. Okay, so anyway, this is uh, kind of the key sources for the work. I can answer more questions about it. Newspapers are really important to the study of lynching, but also our traditional kind of archival sources like diaries and journals and then government records, uh, especially at certain times, are very critical for the study of lynching, especially, like, say, for example, during Reconstruction, but other times as well. Okay, anyway, these are my kind of, I've done four books. These are three of my books. This is the, the Making of Lynching Culture is the one that this talk is based, based on for the most part, and it's about Central Texas, uh, the, the place that produced the Jesse Washington lynching. My next book, which is actually probably my most famous book, uh, the one that's been the most cited, is a book on the lynching of Mexicans in the United States. And I can talk about that in the question and answer as well. Um, and then this is a book on lynching and global perspective. It's really about the fact that the Americans did not invent the practice of mob violence, but Americans did invent the word lynching. It's an American word. And this book, and one of the things it does is traces the kind of spread of the word lynching throughout other cultures. When did the Japanese start using the American word lynching? When did the Germans start using the American word lynching? When, and it's just kind of interesting to kind of look at that history. And they also mean different things by lynching. Lynching is a word that its meaning has changed over time. And it means different things in different uh, cultures. So that's what that book is uh, largely about. Anyway, uh, moving on. So let's talk about the definition of lynching and where it comes from. So lynching began, and the word was kind of coined in the 18th century by this guy Charles Lynch, who was a judge who hanged some British Tories without trial. And so it became kind of to mean extra legal violence, uh, swift justice, uh, usually uh, to kind of uh, punish somebody who has done something, you know, very threatening to the larger community. Uh, but the definition of lynching was fluctuate quite a bit. And for most of, for example, the early 19th century, lynching meant extra legal violence, but not necessarily lethal violence. So if you look at like the you know, 1830s, 1840s, a lot of times something will be identified as lynching, it will be like a tarring and feathering or something like that, or banishing someone from a town, will be, they will be lynched. Uh, the definition keeps on shifting, always shifts, even up to the present. But I will just say this about how I define the act of violence uh, that uh, I will refer to as lynching. For me, it's different from murder. It has to be, right? It, it, it's, otherwise, what are you doing if you're just studying, you want to study murder? I'm not just studying murder. What I mean by lynching is an extra legal act uh, that is lethal uh, and uh, has widespread community support. Now, the definition of widespread community support has been one that people have argued about for a very long time. Uh, I will argue that community support is essential to the definition of lynching, and if you take community support out of the definition of lynching, it's, it, it loses uh, its power and its meaning. For me, Lynching is really interesting to study because it's a window into the minds of ordinary people who didn't leave behind lots of written records about what they were doing. We know their actions, and therefore we can try to interpret some of their, uh, their motivations from that. So, uh, but if you take away uh, this community element, I think it, it really loses something. So for me, when I talk about lynching and mob violence, I'm talking about an extra legal murder that had widespread community support. We can talk about how to define that. Uh, later on, maybe. All right. Um, now, one of the things that I came across very early uh, was that lynching had not always had the racial component that it would later come to have. Uh, prior to 1890 or so, probably most of the victims of lynching were not black. Um, it's uh, a lot of different reasons for that, uh, but a lot of white victims of lynching in the early period, a lot of Mexican victims of lynching, and quite a few African American victims, they were also disproportionately lynched versus their size of the population. But lynching after, say, 1890 becomes very different. Lynching victims after 1890 are about 95% African American. Uh, and so that's why historians call this the racialization of lynching. The lynching becomes something that had probably always had a racial component because American society is deeply infused from the very beginning with these racial elements. But it wasn't uh, what it would become. It was an incredibly disparate uh, kind of punishment that was seemingly reserved only for African Americans. <coughs> Anyway, uh, so that's kind of part of this story, is trying to figure out how that happened. 
uh, eventually getting to what we call these spectacle lynchings. Mm -hmm. uh, spectacle lynching is a phrase developed by historians to explain these very massive crowds that included these ritualized elements, such as what happened with uh, Jesse Washington, but in other cases as well. What's important is that these spectacle lynchings were also not that common earlier. They're really also a product of the same period of racialization. That not that there are not large crowds sometimes before 1890, but they're infrequent and they often don't include these other ritualized elements. So this is also kind of a, a post-reconstruction development for the most part. Um, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, that's, that's the case. All right. So let me go back and talk about when I started doing the study, one of the things I wanted to do is keep on, wanted to push back uh, the study. So Jesse Washington in 1916, I quickly became convinced that I needed to understand kind of the deeper seated cultural issues that went back. And I went back and back and kept on going back and back and back in history, eventually studying all the way into the 1830s. And uh, one of the things that I found was that extra legal violence against African Americans but against other groups prior to uh, the 1880s or, or so, there oftentimes was a very clear, sometimes implicit, uh, sometimes just direct political economic justification for the violence. So what I mean by this is that, say for example, during Reconstruction, the goals of the people who are uh, perpetrating the violence, Ku Klux Klan and other mob folks, they wanted to destabilize the Republican governments and the efforts to create multiracial government in, in the South and in Texas. They were not um, trying to uh, mask that justification. They assassinated white Republican leaders, they assassinated black Republican leaders, they assassinated black voters, and there was no attempt to justify it in the way that later on you would see these explanations of why this person was lynched. And the same kind of thing is true in earlier periods. So for example, there's a lot of what I would consider mob violence against Native Americans. Later on in the late 19th century, you have the army doing so much of the violence against indigenous people. But in the earlier period, a lot of times it's extra legal neighbors who form posses to go after and uh, punish Native Americans who they consider to be threatening them or these other kinds of things. And that violence is also not, they don't, they don't justify it. They just, it's simply like, we want this to be free of Native Americans, we want the land. All these kind of justifications are just kind of, not, they're not even debated, they're not masked in any of this kind of way. So, and, and of course the same thing is true with other forms of violence. There's two wars of Mexico, there's the Civil War. Uh, like during the Civil War, for example, there's lots of mob violence, oftentimes against white unionists in Texas. Like most of the violence in the I study during the Civil War period is white people who are anti-Confederate. That's who is being lynched. But once again, they don't, they don't accuse them of murder or rape or anything. They just say, you are resisting the draft, you are opposing the Confederacy, and you know, the most, one of the most famous lynchings in the United States happens in Gainesville, Texas, uh, during this period when all these white unionists are killed, and the crime is that they oppose the draft, right? Anyway, all right, so long story short, in the early period, mob violence and extra legal violence has these very kind of clear, on the surface, political, economic justifications. And uh, later on, you start to see the mobs uh, justifying their acts in different kinds of ways. And so now we're getting into the kind of period that I'm mostly talking about, the post-reconstruction period. And here, if you look at what the mobs themselves say, the mobs don't oftentimes, you know, they just do their act. Sometimes they will pin messages to the corpse that they've lynched. But a lot of times these justifications are in newspapers, where the newspaper editors are defending uh, and applauding the work of the lynch mob. And one of the things they will say is that the legal system was weak and uh, that this had to be done in order to you know, apply justice. Here's a quote from actually a California miner that I like. Uh, I am opposed to capital punishments in communities when they have prisons to keep murderers secure for life. But in new settlements and new countries like California, where there is little or no protection from the hands of such monsters in human shape, it becomes necessary to dispose of them by the shortest mode for the safety of the community. Now this is, I don't know how much time I have to go into all this, but the California Gold Rush was incredibly important in the history of lynching. Mm -hmm. Because the California Gold Rush, first of all, had a massive amount of lynching. 
a massive amount of extra legal violence. And it was the clear one time in the history of the West where the legal authorities were really overmatched. So many people came in. It was so easy to find gold. You could not find people to be jailers. You could not find people to sit on juries. You could not do any of this stuff. And what, at least in some parts of California, it truly was the case. There was no legal constituted authorities. Now, that wasn't the case in Los Angeles. That wasn't the case where a lot of violence happened. But in some parts of the Gold Rush country, there clearly was a breakdown in law. But what happened, and this actually ended up changing minds, because this guy, John Eagle, was from New England. And all these New Englanders and Northerners wrote back to the New York Times and to other publications that, hey, just like this, you might, like me, be opposed to capital punishment, but you can't be opposed here because it's chaos and anarchy and criminality and all this kind of stuff. And it actually changed minds, right? Lynching and lynchers became something kind of positive. Uh, defenders of the community who are willing to use violence to restore order and punish criminals. And so there's this change in the idea of what lynching is. Lynching prior to the California Gold Rush had been associated with anti-abolition activities and these other kinds of things, and it was considered negative in the North. After the California Gold Rush, lynching became almost seen as a positive thing. One of the kind of interesting little quirks of history is that during Reconstruction, when the KKK is putting up all their violence, the KKK wants their violence to be seen as lynching. And the Republicans don't want it to be seen as lynching. Because for the KKK to be seen as lynchers is to give them a positive uh, association with the California violence. Instead, the Republican press is like, this is not a lynching. The KKK is committing outrages, terrorism, but not lynching. That just gives you a sense of, I told you before, about how the word lynching changes over time. Obviously very different than the way that lynch will be understood by the time you get to the late 19th century. Anyway, so the, the point of this is that long, long, long after there was no longer this issue of the weakness of the courts, after you know the early part of the gold rush is over, now there's legal constituted authorities all over, even in the most you know, uh, gold-rich parts of California, this period of, of the weakness of the legal system is really short. Now, later on, you still have critics of the legal system who wish that it would, you know, give out more death sentences and that kind of stuff, but it becomes different than this justification that was here. Anyway, the popularity of this defense <coughs> means it lasts for a long time. So lynch mobs will continue to use the weakness of the courts for you know, a long, long, long time, even though really the period when it really applied was only this early period in the California Gold Rush. Anyway, mobs will oftentimes say this as a reason why they uh, lynched. The other thing they will talk about is the heinousness of the crime. This is a, a Georgia political activist, Rebecca Latimer Felton. She said, if it needs lynching to protect a woman's dearest possession from the ravenous human beast, then I say lynch a thousand times a week if necessary. Uh, this becomes, uh, it, this will eventually replace the weakness of the courts as kind of the primary justification. The, I call this, the sexual assault and rape will become this uh, new phenomenon, this new crime. What's really interesting is that if you look at the early period after Reconstruction, during Reconstruction, sexual assault, uh, even of white women by black men, does not lead always to lynching. Uh, especially if the white woman was of poor background or questionable character or these other kinds of things. Class plays a role. But if you look at the legal records uh, of, um, of Central Texas, you can find lots and lots of legal cases where a black man is sent to prison for five years for rape of a white woman. No lynching, no effort to lynch, all this kind of stuff. Now, that disappears over time. And by the time you get to the 1890s, any hint of a, of a rape of a white woman by a black man, of whatever class background, will lead to an effort to lynch at least, if not actual lynching. So this is kind of a, a, a changing of the thing. In my book, which I had more time to talk about all this stuff, I argue that it's because of the fading out of the other one. As the state penitentiary system grows, it becomes harder for people to wink at the weakness of the legal system. The weakness of the legal system argument becomes it's paper thin, increasingly paper thin, and a new justification, this one, is going to replace it. Okay, of course, what the mobs say, why they lynch, is of course not 
the whole story. And so there's these unstated motivations, I call them. Of course, one of them is ethnic and racial prejudice. This is one that, of course, I suspected right from the very beginning. I'm sure all of you suspected as a big factor for why Jesse Washington was lynched. Of course, it's not sufficient. Uh, well, Malcolm X said, if you live south of the Canadian border, you live in the south. And maybe that's a, a dramatic statement by Malcolm X, but what he meant by that is that racism is not a southern thing. Racism is an American thing. And, but it's not every part of the United States that has Jesse Washington lynchings. It's not every part of even Texas that has Jesse Washington lynchings. Racial prejudice is too broad a category to explain this particular history of, of lynching. So it's a factor, but not sufficient to explain it. The other one is these ongoing political and economic issues. So even though the very explicit uh, political desire to overthrow radical reconstruction is over. Uh, political factors and economic factors are still there in the background. Now it's much more about like we don't want the Republicans to come back. We don't want this coalition to reform. And African Americans are still resisting. African Americans are still saying we deserve the right to vote. We want our rights. So there's still resistance by African Americans. There's still worry. The Populist Party, for example, it's not really a coincidence that lynching kind of begins to surge when the Populist Party seems at least at one point to be a threat to the Democratic Party and potentially a multiracial alliance of populists is threatening to, to the white South. So anyway, economic and political factors are not maybe as important as they were earlier, but they're still there for sure. Uh, and then the one that I really emphasize in my book, the part of my book that's probably the most uh, new and uh, important to the historiography is my emphasis on psychological factors. And what I argue is that certainly in Central Texas, uh, masculinity becomes associated with violence. Mm -hmm. To be a real man is to be one who is willing to commit violence uh, in pursuit and defense of your family and the social order. And I believe that this had been true for a long time in Texas, but uh, there are particular reasons why this desire ends up manifesting itself in lynching during this period. One of the things that I talk about is the power of historical memory. Here's a quote from an editor, a conservative editor of the Waco newspaper in 1893. Lynching becomes chronic and contagious. Boys grow to manhood with the idea ingrained in them that lynch law is right and proper and worthy of applause, and they follow the example set them by their fathers. And what I argue uh, in the book is that after the end of Reconstruction, Native Americans are, don't, they're, kicked out of Texas, there are no more Native Americans in Texas, that last reservation was overrun by mob violence. There's a mob destroys the last reservation in Texas and they, they come with a banner, necessity knows no law. Mm -hmm. An extra legal group of, of people who destroy the last reservation. There's no Native Americans to fight. There's no more wars with Mexico. Uh, there's no uh, Kate, you know, new to overthrow the reconstruction governments. Where is the outlet for young men who want to show that they, like their fathers and grandfathers, are willing to defend their families and their community with violence. Well, lynching becomes that avenue for them uh, to display their masculinity and their willingness. Uh, I will just say that, you know, especially in Central Texas, you know, the culture venerates those who fought Native Americans. They're, they're, they're considered heroes. Their streets are named after them, statues are built, all those kinds of things. Those who fought the Native Americans are heroes in this period of time in Texas. Uh, slavery has an important factor in the historical memory because slavery uh, included the extra-legal uh, control of African-American criminality, right? African-Americans who committed crimes, theft on the plantation, or other kinds of acts, they didn't go through the court system, right? They were uh, punished by the master or the overseer or maybe the slave patrol. And of course, I would argue that the slave patrol is, is, it's not a coincidence that it looks very similar to the lynch mobs that would replace it later. So slavery has an important impact on the history and memory of lynching. And then of course, the Ku Klux Klan the, uh, and the Re Reconstruction. Reconstruction is incredibly important to the history of lynching in my opinion because Reconstruction is absolutely, clearly involves racial violence determined to uh, upend the effort to create multiracial government. And that violence is successful, 
right? From the perspective of the clan and its allies, they won. They defeated this crazy radical effort to uh, give civil rights to African Americans. And a key part of their success was violence. For them, violence was a key positive from this period. So when people are growing up in this late 19th century period, they look at these people who overthrew and stopped radical reconstruction as heroes. You can look at this, in, in all these southern states there's this kind of person, but in Texas it's Richard C. Koch. Richard Koch is the first redeemer governor who takes over after the Republicans. And you will find in these memories, you can look at the, uh, the New Deal memories, the people in the 1930s, or this is like interviews done in the Works Progress Administration, the Great Depression, and they will say, like the best day in their life was not the birth of their children, or they that married their wife, the best day in their life was when Richard Koch became governor, right? That will be what they'll say. So the Reconstruction is really powerful in uh, kind of shaping memory of uh, racial violence and, and lynching. Okay, so all of this kind of comes together, in my opinion, to lead to the age of spectacle lynchings. Okay, and uh, so anyway, that's that's kind of my how the, the answer to the question why northern people lynch is kind of the things I've covered so far. Uh, how am I doing on time? What do I got here? Uh oh, we'll see how I can go from here. I, uh, that's the main answer. But I wanted there's a lot of other questions that people usually ask, and I want to go through them. First of all. Uh, I study Central Texas, but is what I study uh, applicable to other parts of the, of the United States? And of course, I want to say the answer is yes. Lynching is not only restricted to Central Texas, it's not only restricted to the South. In fact, it happened uh, outside of the South in many different ways. Here's the lynching of Will Brown three years after Jesse Washington in Omaha, Nebraska. It's a famous image of the lynching of two African Americans in Indiana in 1930. So lynching was not restricted just to Central Texas. What I will argue is that media attention uh, to spectacle lynchings had two effects that might seem contradictory, but I think are both true, because the United States is a, is a, is a fascinating place to study because it's a land of contradictions. The attention to spectacle lynchings by newspapers all over the world did lead to the rise of a bunch of people who were opposed to lynching and thought it was terrible and sought to end it, but it also probably led other people to want to do it. Right, to believe that it was the proper response mm -hmm. to certain kinds of criminal activities. And I believe that you can see both of these in the, in the history of, of lynching. So uh, let me move on to this next question. Why did lynching decline? Of course, there are some people who are, say maybe lynching didn't decline. And this comes to the issue of how does one define lynching? So for me, lynching and hate crimes are different. Uh, for others, the, the difference will be very subtle. For me, a hate crime is a murder that has a, uh, a justification that's based in race or ethnicity or religion or a gender or these other kinds of categories. So it's a murder with this element added to it. To me, lynching has, as I mentioned before, this public community support. So for me, you know, all lynchings are hate crimes, but not all hate crimes are lynchings. Others will disagree on that, it'll, it'll differ, and, we'll, and, and there's always arguments at the margin. But for me, I am looking, when I'm talking about why lynching decline, I'm talking about why did the public support uh, for lynching decline. In other words, even though we have lots of racial violence today, we don't tend to have what happened to Jesse Washington, which is in the middle of the day, thousands of people photographed, uh, burning someone alive, and, and there being no investigation, no grand jury, nothing at all. That kind of stuff doesn't happen. All right. So one of the reasons that it happens is because of the, the, the what I mentioned before. The immediate attention to lynching does begin to shape a narrative that those communities that allow lynching are barbaric, savage, and uh, you know not part of modern civilization. And that message resonates with the New South business elite. Like the civic leadership, the business leadership in Waco, for example, does not like the fact that their city is now identified with this activity. They think, probably correctly, that it's going to limit people wanting to invest or move, locate their business in Waco and these kinds of things. So the civic and business leadership kind of begin to work behind the scenes to try to limit lynching in the future. And I think that in Waco they're, they're not immediately successful, but I would say that they are um, very important that lynching after Jesse Washington is never the same. 
there will be racial violence, but what happens is that there's much more legal punishment and investigation by the authorities. The authorities have been told you cannot let this go without punishment, and it takes a while for the mobs to realize that if they do this, they're not going to be able to get away with it. So there's a little disjuncture between these two, but eventually uh, people decide that if they want to kill black people, they have to do it in private, and they can't uh, identify themselves publicly or else that they could be at risk of being punished. Um, of course, the resistance of various different groups is part of this, right? So the reason why it's in the media, the reason why it's getting covered is because of the work of the NAACP, the result of the Anti-Defamation League, which of course many people don't know was actually created in response to Leo Frank uh, and his lynching. Uh, anyway, those groups are really important in kind of shaping uh, the way in which lynching is perceived. So from the late 19th century, early 20th century, lynching will take on closer to the definition of what it is today, which is that it's a racialized uh, mob, uh, act of mob violence. Now, to kind of talk a little bit more about lynching in the present and mob violence in the present, this is quite a while ago, in 1998, but I do think this story illustrates the difference in what I'm trying to talk about. These three men, and some of you in the room remember this, others, of course, weren't born yet. These three men uh, murdered James Byrd Jr. He was a 49-year-old black man. They dragged him behind their pickup uh, until he basically fell apart and died. Uh, and the difference between what these three individuals did and what happened earlier was that the rural Texas community in which this happened was not proud of it, was not even able, willing to tolerate it. And a all-white jury uh, found these men guilty of murder. Um, Brewer was executed in 2011. King, I believe, is still on death row, and Barry is serving life in prison. This is very different than what, of course, happened to the people who had lynched Jesse Washington or, or numerous others. So for me, this uh, story indicates to me that racial violence continues, but it is a different kind of world that we live in now uh, than it was then. Now, on the other hand, it does not mean that we're forever in this new world. Right? If community sanction is key to the definition of lynching, community sanction can return. Lynching could come back. Right? It's not forever gone. I just think that there's a fundamental change that happened after uh, in the middle of the 20th century, and uh, but it's I, I'm not promising that there's no lynchings in the present or can't be lynchings in the future. All right, let me continue to try to wrap up here. Let's have time for questions. So, what has been the legacy of lynching? Do I think if it's not that the act continues, uh, what's the legacy of lynching? Well, one thing is that it's no coincidence that the states that have the greatest number of legal executions were the states that had the greatest number of lynchings in the past. There's pretty clear evidence by this one historian, uh, Michael Pfeiffer, I think, that there was a, almost a deal made that uh, we will agree to let the state take over the punishment of, uh, of black criminals as long as the state is willing to punish them with death in a speedy, quick fashion. Uh, some scholars, including my old advisor, George Wright, call these acts often legal lynchings. Um, <clears throat> the other thing is interesting about the police is, of course, today I think you know we don't we didn't need George Floyd to remind us that one of the great tensions in the late 20th and early 21st century has been relationships between the African American community and local police. Mm -hmm. What's really interesting is that this is also a phenomenon of the decline of lynching. It's interesting if you look in the like say uh, you know 1880s. African Americans will not see the police as the, the greatest danger to their lives or their safety. They will actually see the police as people who could protect them from lynch mobs. Right? And the police, are, the police are often battling lynch mobs and overwhelmed by lynch mobs in this period of time. And it's really a, a flip uh, after when lynching ends, then the police and the state become the folks who are to now regulate black behavior. But Prior to, you know, I don't know, maybe 1890, the old idea that black criminality was regulated not by the state, but by mobs, individuals, that idea took a long time to go away. The new world that we live in, this world, is really a post-lynching uh, kind of phenomenon. Um, 
Not that there weren't racist police who did all kinds of racist things in the past. I'm not trying to say that. I'm just trying to say the fundamental relationship is different. Uh, the other thing is the segregation of memory. Um, blacks and whites don't remember the past the same. Um, this course, it came out when I was doing this research. Uh, it's a really fascinating uh, story about the memory of Jesse Washington's lynching at that time I'll, I'll share with you. Uh, I think those of us who lived through Hurricane Katrina uh, know this as well. Like, I would say that the average white person remembers, the, if they remember the hurricane at all now, because it's been a while, if they remember the hurricane at all, they remember the hurricane as a terrible natural disaster that had devastating consequences. I would say African Americans tend to remember it as a terrible man-made disaster that involved nature. Uh, and those are two different interpretations of the same event. Uh, and lynching and its history of racial violence has some of the same kinds of things. Blacks and whites don't remember these events the same, and it makes it hard for the two groups to communicate and talk. And I would say, just a good little hint, in the 20 years since I published my first book, this divide, this uh, cultural division between these two visions of the past has only gotten more extreme uh, and more, more challenging. Okay. Uh, can I possibly end on a positive note? Can I? The whole thing has been about how depressing this is. Uh, let me try to talk about uh, a little bit about where I would go if I was trying to build bridges and, and move forward. And in general, I tell people all the time that only an optimist can study the history of lynching for as long as I did. You know, I, I actually tend to believe uh, that, um, and it's been hard at times, uh, that in general, education, discussion of the past, learning about these things can help us as a society move forward and, uh, and be better than we were in the past. I still believe that, even though there are days when it's hard. Anyway, here is the Garden of the Righteous Among the Nations, which some of you who study the Holocaust know about. This is a place in which uh, uh, Jews decided to honor non-Jews who helped during the Holocaust, right? And uh, there's the tree planted for the Schindlers, right? Schindler's List, you know the Schindlers. Uh, I think that this is a great model for us to consider as we think about how to remember the history of lynching. Uh, for every lynching that happened, uh, there probably was at least one lynching that was stopped, one lynching that was uh, prevented by different uh, people. Uh, that history of prevented lynching varies by region. Probably a lot of prevented lynchings in the Midwest. Uh, some prevented lynchings in New England. Uh, uh, not as many, and certainly not as high ratio in the South or in Texas, but all over there were these prevented lynchings. And the folks who are responsible for this are many. There are journalists like Ida B. Wells who sh shone the light of truth upon lynching. I kind of find myself in, in her lineage and shadows. Uh, there's civil rights organizations that I've already mentioned. Uh, but there also are others who I think the story is not well known. Uh, diplomats from other countries would protest the lynching of their nationals in the United States, particularly Mexico, but also China and Italy. That also made a difference in the, uh, this history of the decline of lynching, uh, and I think their story is very unknown. There also were judges and prosecutors and sheriffs and other us uh, who uh, went against kind of majority opinion uh, in opposing lynching. There's this one guy in in Texas, uh, Sam Scott, uh, and this is a quote from him at a, at a grand jury, the worst thing on the fair name of the county was the white captain, it's a type of mob violence against African American, uh, I can explain more later, do, do not let the prominence of the party shield them from investigation because the treatment given the Negroes was outrageous and the mob members were 10 times worse than the victims of their wrath. Central Texas courts had never before this indicted a white man for the lynching of a black man, but in 1896 as a result of Judge Scott they indicted 10. Right? Now, they didn't convict them, but his actions in doing this led to there to be no lynchings in Central Texas for nine years. As you might think mob members are brave, they're actually not. Right? They go along with the crowd. If you tell a lynch mob member, hey, you might go to jail, or even if your name is published in the newspaper, that can matter. Individuals can matter in the history of lynching. Central Texas, which had lots of lynchings before and after Sam Scott, had no lynchings during this period because of this one individual. Uh, there also are... Uh, sheriffs and law officers who also risked their lives. Uh, sometimes it didn't always work, you know, but you can see multiple cases of this person where a sheriff will say, look, you will probably not be punished if you break into jail and lynch this white person. No one will care. But I'm not going to let you do that. 
less of my dead body. And if you kill a white sheriff, they're going to care. Mm -hmm. Are you sure you want to do this? And then sometimes they shoot him in the leg and they lynch the guy. <laughs> and sometimes they don't. They back off. It depends. Uh, it's dangerous. And in the South, if a sheriff does that, they get voted out and are not sheriff next election. <laughs> in the Midwest, if they allow the lynching to happen, they are voted out and not the sheriff the next time. And that helps explain some of the reason why these differences in the prevented lynchings. Anyway, sometimes actually a relative will also be key. So the brother of a lynching victim or the father of a lynching victim will stand up before the mob and say, our family has been through enough. We do not want a lynching to add to our woe. Please don't do this. And that will sometimes be very effective at standing down the mob. Other times, of course, the father and the brother will be the ones with the rope, right? It will vary. Anyway, uh, guess what I wanted to kind of end on is that lynching is very difficult to talk about. It's a, it's a tough subject at any level. To me, the best way to bridge gaps and to talk to people about it is to talk about uh, these folks who stood up to moms. That's the kind of behavior we want from our young people and from, I guess, all of our citizens. We want people willing to stand up to moms. Talking about those who did successfully do it is a more positive story. At the same time, you can't tell the story of why prevented lynchings is important without actually telling the story of lynchings that happened. And so you can slip in all the history of Jesse Washington and Leo Frank while you're also telling it from this perspective of lynchings being prevented. I've suggested this multiple times, and unfortunately we're in a very divisive world where the two sides don't want, it seems to me, uh, to go with this approach. There's a group of folks who just want to, you know, highlight the shameful acts of the past and not give any quarter to any positive elements such as prevented lynchings. And there's another group who just want to focus on the criminal activities of the lynched and basically say they deserve to be lynched because of their murderous activities and deny that it was racially motivated. And these two groups don't talk to each other or want to talk to each other. It's just kind of a war between these two camps. And it's part of our larger society cultural division. Um, and it's really sad. It's really sad. Okay, so I tried to end on a positive note. Not sure I did, but thank you very much. I took a little bit longer, I promised Ron. I would end five minutes earlier than this, but I do have some time for questions. And I do know some of you have to leave early as well. Uh, yes, sir. Um, you, are you familiar with the hashtag um, run with Ma? I don't know that hashtag. Um, I forget his name, but, um, or not even Alman, um, this man was seemingly lynched, I forget where, but he was jogging, and these white men, three white men shot him. Yes, uh -huh. yeah, 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 okay, I, I never talked about that, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, th that is a, that's a, an episode that is certainly a hate crime, and the question is, how supportive was the larger community of what these individuals did? And for me, it wouldn't rise to the level of lynching because they were uh, legally punished. Now, for other people, they're going to say, well, there wasn't enough legal punishment. They should have been this, that, and the other thing. And, and I can't really argue with them. You know, this is one of these things where I can see their perspective, even if I value making this distinction. I don't really want to equate that with Jesse Washington. I don't want it to be the same thing. But I understand it's a slippery slope, and the line is, is tough. We have to talk about Mahaya. Afterwards, I see your, your shirt there. So, Mahaya is very close to Waco in Texas. I played football against the Mahaya Black Cats. So, uh, anyways, we'll talk about Mahaya later. Yes, Emily. So, I, I just had a question, and this is something that I, I had seen kind of off and on. Um, and I, I get your, I totally 100% understand your point about the community support for lynching. Mm -hmm. But um, I, I wondered, because I had seen a number of newspapers about families whose young men whose had been had been found hanging um, in places like Mississippi within the last 20 years, like in front yards and woods, um, where the family says, my child was lynched. There's marks of violence. Like these, there's, you know, there's suspicion, right? And the Washington Post published an article and said, you know, they, I think they quoted um, the head of the NAACP saying, like, lynching never stopped. So so we have these crimes mm -hmm. where there there is hanging involved. 
young black men, you know, with evidence of, you know, what, what I feel like I would jump to conclusions and be like, oh my God, you know, this is, you know, these people are being murdered. And like, why, why are we, you know, calling, I mean, it's like, to me, is it like, is there, are we calling it a suicide because we're afraid to say lynching is happening in these quiet ways? Like, I, I don't know, like, it, it's just such a scary thing because it's like, I read about these, these lynchings mm -hmm. that are called suicides, but the family and, you know, these civil rights groups are saying, no, these are lynchings mm -hmm. that are happening right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a, it's a great question, and I don't have, uh, I disagree with those who want to call those things lynchings, but I understand why they do. Lynching is a political word. I'm a scholar, so I try to apply my scholarly definition, but it's tricky because the word, it matters. Why does people want to call it lynchings? Why do they care? Because it matters. If you can get this person's death to be called a lynching, it will lead to greater investigation, more public support. It has direct consequences politically to call it a lynching. Um, so I understand why they want to do it. And I would never really tell a family you can't call it a lynching. Uh, for me, as a scholar, you know, I want to see evidence that the community supports this more than hey, Mississippi has a lot of racist people you know, in the area. You know, I want a little bit more than that. But that's kind of my scholarly perspective. If I was an activist, if I was working for the Equal Justice Initiative, or I was investigating that case, maybe I would choose the tactic of trying to go that route. But as a scholar, I just feel like if we, we have to hold on to some definition, if I'm going to count lynchings and I'm going to talk about these things in terms of numbers, uh, and so I have my own line in the sand as to where it is. For other people, the line is different. It's a murky situation. Lynching is not easy to define, not easy to count, all those kinds of things. I also, I tend to believe in counting. I tend to believe in statistics more than most people. And the reason why I do this is because it's easy for people to disbelieve purely qualitative statements. You know, someone says, you know, thousands of African Americans were lynched. Thousands of Mexicans were lynched. That's very different than seeing a list. This person lynched in this place on this state for this crime. That list is powerful and important. But if you don't, if that list is just any black person who was ever murdered, then it becomes not very powerful. And I'm not trying to say that, well, I have tended to try to be on the conservative side of that because I felt that's the most advantageous uh, for me as a scholar. Like to be to have a, a very liberal interpretation of lynching, I think would bring my work into question. Um, and I'm okay with having people who think I'm I, I'm not including enough cases uh, criticize me, and I can understand that, and I can say maybe you're right, uh, but I prefer that over the other. Although I still get criticized. You know, these cases should not be a lynching, that case shouldn't be a lynching. I get all that, especially with regard to Mexicans that work. I have people who definitely on both sides of it think that I counted things wrongly. Uh, so anyway, I, I absolutely hear what you're saying. I hope that's the, that's the best answer I can give. Okay. Uh, another question. Yeah, Ron. Can you talk a little more about the role of Mario Welch and the voice mm -hmm. in terms of what they did to yeah. publicize what was going on? Yeah, Ida B. Wells is a fascinating person. I told me she was from Tennessee. She, it, one of the other things that I, I, I think is very fascinating is that it's not just white society that had this definition of lynching as not being very racialized. African Americans also had it. And in fact, African Americans were often involved in lynching and lynched other African Americans early on in this period. Black on black lynching happened for sure, especially in the earlier period. If you would have asked Ida B. Wells, is lynching a very racialized crime in, say, 1878? I don't think she would have said yes. And by her own memoir, she says that what happened was these friends of hers that she knew got lynched, and she began to investigate. And after her investigation, she began to conclude that she hadn't been really paying attention, but lynching was, was, a, way of, it was a form of racial control. And Ida B. Wells is one of the first African Americans to have this realization. And then she, through her great uh, journalism and activism, ended up changing minds about this. 
The whole reason that we have this new understanding of lynching as being a racial crime, particularly focused on African Americans, starts really with Ida B. Wells. There also are some other important journalists um, that also are involved in this early uh, kind of transformation of the definition of lynching. And then Du Bois comes along later in this process, but Du Bois is a very, also a very important person. In fact, I didn't really say, but the reason why we have these photographs of Jesse Washington is because of W.B. Du Bois. They were taken uh, at the time by this local white photographer, but what Du Bois did uh, as the head of the NAACP is that he knew this case could be potentially very helpful to him. He was trying to pass an anti-lynching law. So what he did is he had one of his allies, a white suffragist who was in Dallas trying to advocate for women's suffrage, he wired her and asked her if she would go undercover in Waco and investigate the Jesse Washington lynching. Her name was Elizabeth Freeman. She would also be on my list of heroes uh, of this period. She would undercover, charm these conservative uh, white folks, and they were like, oh, are you sure you can have copies of these photographs that we had? And they gave her all the photographs. And she said, you know, would you tell me who are the leaders of the mob? And they told her the leaders of the mob. And then Du Bois published in a front page story in the crisis, all the photographs, her whole story, the names of all the lynching uh, leaders, all this kind of stuff. And it was an incredibly powerful story. Did not lead to the anti-lynching law passed by Congress, which was blocked by Southern senators. It did not lead to any punishment for the people involved in Jesse Washington's murder, but it was a powerful moment in the history of lynching. And I do think it mattered, as I said, with those civic and business leaders. It embarrassed them and led them to take a different approach uh, in the future. Yes? On the subject of an anti-lynch law, you can, uh, you can see uh, photos, I don't really remember over how long a period of time is extended, but the NAACP in its campaign uh, to pass it, um, uh, an lynch law, uh, they would have uh, demonstrations on Fifth Avenue in New York, and you could see photos of the, the banners on Fifth Avenue saying, a man was lynched today. Yes, yes. Yeah, very proud. I had one of those images in the slideshow earlier, but you're absolutely correct. Yeah. Yeah. Other uh, questions or comments? In the back there, yes. Now, can I, and maybe this is a, a bit broad, but can you, as an academic and someone who has studied uh, a, a situation that clearly has racial undertones, um, and this is the part that perhaps isn't quite fair. Can you understand, based upon the work that you've done, why anyone in this country could make a statement that there has not been racism in this country? <laughs> Particularly someone who makes a I tell uh, my students ask me something very similar, and I say, your first problem is looking for historical analysis from politicians. <laughs> That is not the, that's not their their okay. mission uh, is to uh, is to give accurate readings of the past. So I said, if you really thought uh, this politician was going to give you the truth about the past, that that's your first first misstep. Uh, so I don't really have a good answer to that question, but uh, but yeah, it's, uh, I will say I've had some I've had some real humdingers of, of questions. I, I thought maybe you were on the verge, but ended up uh, you didn't you didn't make the top list. The, all-time humdingers of questions I've gotten in talks like this was one elderly African-American woman stood up and she said, Dr. Kerrigan, I would like you to confirm that all the people that lynched Jesse Washington are burning in hell today. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I did not discover that in my research, but it could very well be true. Uh, and then I had another elderly white woman stand up at the same exact talk and said, isn't it true, Dr. Kerrigan, that all the people in the Jesse Washington lynch mob were actually federal agents paid by the government to make the South look bad? <laughs> true story. That was an actual question I received. All right, here you go. Um, what was the woman's name that w, uh, Mr. Du Bois Yep. Before Her name was Elizabeth Freeman. Elizabeth with an S. Uh, Elizabeth Freeman. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a great book about the Jesse Washington lynching uh, by um, Patricia Bernstein, and she does a great job on, on Elizabeth Freeman. It was really a good book. Yes? Um, in modern times, what would you consider community support? Because the first lynching you mentioned 
had about 15,000 people out of 30,000. That was half of that population. Mm -hmm. But in modern times, because our communities are much more interconnected, the yeah. people could still be against it. Yeah, it doesn't have to be a majority of people. So for me, it would be something like um, there's you know, very clear evidence that this mob of people killed this person extra legally. And then there's uh, no effort by the constituted authorities to do anything. Doesn't mean that they have to convict the people, but if there's no grand jury indictment, if there's no investigation at all, uh, that certainly would be a very strong indicator to me. So if there's, if you had something like the James Byrd Jr. case, and instead of the Texas authorities punishing those people, instead they just said, you know, we can't find anything, you know, whatever, there's not enough here to prosecute, uh, then I, I would say that that would, that, that, would, that would have made the James Byrd Jr. case a lynching, in my opinion. What makes it not a lynching is the fact that they did prosecute the people and, you know, it was, you know, supported by the community. So it's a, it's, it's a tricky line uh, to, to, to go down, uh, but I, I just, I want to make clear that I, I don't think it's impossible uh, for things to, to go, quote unquote, backwards. Yes? Do you think that um, social media could change how we view lynching? Yes. I mean, I didn't talk about the importance of images, but of course those images were so important to me. But now, you not only have social media, but you have AI. AI can create images of anything. Mm -hmm. And it also destabilizes what people believe when they see it. And this is a new world that we're just entering now, and I don't know exactly what it means. I believe it's more important than ever for us to be able to identify the authentic from the fake, but AI gets smarter and smarter every day, and so it's, it's an ongoing struggle. So uh, it, it definitely, I think, will have an impact uh, going forward for sure. And, you know, as I said, different countries have different definitions of the word lynching. So, you know, for, you know, some people would say that a suicide by somebody who is shamed by social media will be a lynching. Like, I think the French would define that as a lynching. The, lyn the French have this whole way in which media is very connected to the word lynching for them. And so they use lynching in a different kind of way. Um, so it, it, it's, anyway, yeah, it's, it's a... It, it's interesting kind of thing to try to t talk about this in the modern context because the word, I mean, I guess most, many of you know that Clarence Thomas described his own yeah. uh, hearings as a high-tech lynching. And of course, he got on the Supreme Court, you know, and he, yet he described himself as being lynched. And uh, it was a kind of, you know, that was, I was teaching at Spelman College when that happened and it was just like, I couldn't believe it. I mean, a person who came from that background to use that word in this context and how different it was, but it, it showed that he used it on purpose. Clearly it was a plan. It was a politically powerful word that he used uh, to try to uh, win his, his, his seat, which he did. He did. Right? I don't think that discouraged people from using the word lynching. It encouraged people to use the lynching in all these different kind of contexts because it worked. So. Yes? Uh, first of all, thank you for, for this great lecture. And the, uh, you just referenced the power of image. And the, the image that stuck to me is the picture. You know, you see the mom all dressed well for this spectacle. Mm -hmm. You know, Sunday. it's like a Sunday mm -hmm. kind of spectacle. Mm -hmm. That is uh, very powerful. That's real. So, um, so and, and, you know, I, I just wanted to make this comment because it yeah. affects people, how people, uh, yeah. you know, Absolutely. confront that, these situations. Yeah, I and, didn't even... To, to be in the public, to be part of yeah. this horrific uh, act. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we still, uh, and, and for some reason, that images brings me to January 6th mm -hmm. in Washington. Mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, we cannot, uh, you know, we, we connect that. Yeah. You know, we have a mob. Yeah, there certainly was a mob. There certainly was a mob, and yeah. mob mentality displayed on that day. I will say that I didn't even talk about some of the craziest parts of the Jesse Washington lynching. To me, of all the moments, the craziest is that there was a, a young boy who climbed up a tree. Uh -huh. 
in order to get a better view of the lynching. But the fire from the lynching spread quickly and surrounded the tree that he was in. They called out the fire department to rescue the boy while letting Jesse Washington continue to burn. Yes? Well, just uh, to go off what Carlos was saying, um, and, and also to connect your idea about um, violence of, of by men, um, and, and passing that down to the next generation, um, schools were let out mm -hmm. as, mm -hmm. when there was an announcement of a lynching, mm -hmm. so that everyone could attend. Uh, there'd be headlines in newspapers saying, mm -hmm. so-and-so will be lynched at this time. Yeah. Right? Right. The Jesse Washington was definitely a case in point. They had extra trains. They knew lots of people would want to come in to Waco that day, so they ran extra uh, train runs to get more people in uh, that day. Most of the time, of course, that was not the case. You know, that most lynchings didn't have that level of orchestration and planning and that kind of stuff, but it did happen. It did happen. Any, any other questions? Pressing end on. Is there anything to end on? Question. You didn't mention Emmett Till. I did not mention Emmett Till. Emmett Till is one of the great dividing points uh, for those of us. So is Emmett Till a lynching? Uh, done secretly. Identities of the people were hidden uh, for a long period of time. Eventually, they did go on trial. They were found not guilty by an all-white jury. And then later, they identified themselves publicly in a magazine, saying, yeah, we did do it. So for me, I would, if forced to say, I would say Emmett Till does count as a lynching uh, because of, of the, but then they later, many years later, prosecuted. So it's a tricky one. It's on the edge for me. I would call it a lynching, but it's kind of, it shows you kind of where my line is. Emmett Till is kind of at the edge of my line. So I would still call Emmett Till a lynching, but it's, it's close to the, to the border for me because of, um, of the way that this, they secretly killed them, they didn't kill them in the middle of the day in public, they kept their identities hidden for a long period of time, they only revealed their identities after they had actually um, not been found not guilty by the trial. But nevertheless, I was still called a lynching, but it's, it's a close call. Yes, in the back. Um, I kind of have a question about just the spectacle of it, because mm -hmm. like we also have seen like, like specifically like England, there was public executions, um, I'm pretty sure even in America, um, I feel like, I don't know if it's a thing with time, but like, it just seems so normalized back in the day to see people be murdered. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't really understand like how that's been like, like people could even handle that. Mm -hmm. What's interesting in the history of mob violence is that it becomes more lethal over time. Um, most in the colonial period, they had a lot of mob violence and so-called rioters, but those folks rarely killed anyone. They did things like shut down courthouses, and uh, you know they might burn people in effigy, they might tar and feather, they might drive people out of town. But a lot of the mob violence in the colonial period and even in the early 19th century is not lethal. Um, execution uh, as a form of punishment becomes increasingly popular starting maybe in the 1830s. Uh, sometimes people say the first true lynchings are in uh, Mississippi, and they're actually these white gamblers who are, who are executed for their crimes. And, uh, but it, whatever the case is, it becomes, lynching becomes increasingly lethal from that point forward. Before, there was clear like, okay, you've done this crime, and we think these other forms of punishment might be sufficient for you. And it becomes, execution becomes the kind of the driving force for, for lynching, um, yeah, it, it, increasingly, over time. It doesn't shift overnight, but over time. So I guess one of your things is, and that's a good question, is, is why did this uh, tolerance for murder uh, grow uh, during this period? And it's a, it's a good question. Certainly there was a lot of death and, and murder uh, in the 19th century, and that might be part of it. Yes? So I'm, I'm trying to carefully formulate this mm -hmm. question, and I don't know if I can do it right now, but I, I keep thinking about um, Jan Hus. I, I'm thinking about going 
back to looking at early church reformers mm -hmm, mm -hmm. who were considered heretics who were then burned at the stake. Mm -hmm. Right. But again, this was a celebrated event that all the people came out to see, and I can't help but make that connection from that from hundreds of years ago mm -hmm. up to the, like the same idea of, of celebrating the end of something that is deemed as uh, something we should fear. Right. right, the heretics we fear, and that is we've watched that continue through history. Mm -hmm. and, and I wonder, just if you've made any connections with that, especially with the church and its role, and like we were, we were talking about how it was a Sunday outing to come mm -hmm. and watch and celebrate mm -hmm. this, and how yeah. that might have supported. Yeah, good question. So I will say that neighborhood justice, maybe, or community mm -hmm. justice, or this kind of thing that I call lynching, is ancient. Right, it existed. Uh, you can find evidence in the Bible, you can find yeah, ancient Egypt had it. You know, it is a group of folks in a local community who do not believe that the authorities will take proper, will, 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 that the authorities' response to this crime will be sufficient to their, what they need. That is an ancient thing that has existed in all of human history. It has not always been called lynching, in fact, it mostly has not been called lynching, it's been called something else. But it has existed for a very long time. And religion, but ethnicity, these are often things that motivate it. And it's 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 a challenging thing. If you look in like um, today, if there's like there are people who study modern day lynchings. And some people, of course, are talking about George Floyd and these kinds of things. But a lot of people who study modern lynchings are actually studying these things in Latin America, sometimes also in India and these other kinds of places. And these are often situations where, like, say for example, an indigenous community will hang and execute a government official who they has been, for example, maybe sexually assaulting their women because they feel like they can do it without impunity or stealing from the indigenous community. And the indigenous community will then hang this government official or, or, or murder this government official. And the scholars who are studying this will call this lynching. And of course, these scholars are much more sympathetic to this community who's doing this than, than say, that scholar studying lynching in the United States. Like, these folks are... Uh, are, you can tell that the people who are writing this are, they, they have some sympathy for the indigenous community and how it's been uh, uh, abused by these officials. So, um, and, the, and you can see there's different contexts and there's witchcraft. People are still killed for witchcraft in different parts of the world all the way to the present. Uh, and ethnicity still matters. There's one in the book that I edited the Swift to Wrath book, which is about lynching and the global thing. Part of it is about the spread of the word lynching throughout the world, but the other half is about exactly this question, about there's a whole chapter on witch burning as lynching in that chapter, and there's a whole thing about lynching in other places. One of the chapters deals with kind of modern or recent African history, and what do you do when the state is either completely ineffective or just doesn't care? And this actually is one of the explanations for, I mentioned black on black lynching that happened before, and also Mexican on Mexican lynching. There's definitely a period in the past the United States where the white authorities did not consider black people murdering other black people to be worth their time. They did not consider Mexicans murdering other Mexicans to be worth their time. Especially if the Mexican who did the killing was an ally of the white power structure, and the victim was a member of, I don't know, a poor minority, not important to the white power structure. And so in these contexts, this is oftentimes when you see, when does the black community lynch this black person? It'll be something like this. This black person who thinks he's got a lot of white allies and white friends kills this other black person, maybe to have an affair with his wife or some other weird reason, and thinks that he's not touchable because of his connections with the white community. The black community will be like, you might be untouchable by the white authorities, but they're not untouchable by us, and they will they will kill that guy. Same thing is true for the Mexican community as well. And this happened in the history of the United States, but you can see the same kind of thing happening in other parts of the world today, when the state doesn't care about murder or rape or these other kinds of crimes. Yeah? That's really so interesting, the idea of Frank case, mm -hmm. how it was the lynching of a Jewish man um, he was accused of rape and murder on a black girl, and yet all the evidence pointed towards a black man doing that they were killing. So how white society in Texas then would 
followed that line, you, you wouldn't expect you would have, you would have expected it to go the other way. Right, right. Well, Leo Franke is, is absolutely fascinating in Georgia. Um, Georgia. Yeah, yeah, Georgia. But in, and you can read there's so many great sources on trying to explain this and. It's endlessly fascinating and has produced so many books and plays and all this kind of stuff because it is like this very interesting thing to explain, understand this. Because anti-Semitism in the South is not clear. You know, there are lots of Jewish Southerners who are like serving the Confederate government and, and slaveholders and this kind of stuff. So it's not that the South has like a clear history of anti-Semitism. It has anti-Semitism, but also these other acceptance of Jewish people. And so the Leo Frank case is just endlessly interesting because it doesn't fit in these kinds of uh, narratives. And that's why there's a lot of studies of it, because uh, whenever historians have this thing, it doesn't make any sense to them that's, that they sink their teeth into that and, and like to talk about it and think about it. I know I've run out of time. I'm well way past time. Sorry, uh, Dr. Henry. So uh, thank you very much. I appreciate your time. I'll be here to talk.